we're continuing our series of investigating Babylon. We're actually going to go into part five, where we're looking at the history, the archaeology, um, the the world surrounding early Babylon, the Tower of Babel, and the city uh, that was built as the first kingdom of Babylon. Now, as we've talked about before, that kingdom was still pervasive after the Tower of Babylon was destroyed, and that kingdom, many would suggest, is still is still around today in various forms. So we're actually going to be looking at a unique aspect of the ancient world, and we'll be looking at what is considered the home of the gods, right? And I do want to put the air quotes around the little G gods, because I don't think they're gods at all, right? But the ancient world did. They thought that their rulers were gods, and because their rulers had the ability to do some things that they couldn't, usually. So they they then attributed some sort of godlike status to them and oftentimes would worship them as well. So we're going to be looking at what various cultures talked about as far as where did those rulers live. And that was because many of them did not, according to their ancient records, they did not live with the average person on the ground. So we're going to go look and, and see where they said they did live. I say we just jump right into this. What do you guys say? All right, we're going to investigate Babylon a little further, looking at the home of the gods. And even though I have Mount Olympus on the thumbnail, we're going to be looking at, at uh, more than one culture and what they talked about. So, guys, let's jump into I, I, just as a quick refresher. Um, many people may not many people may not realize that um, what we're doing is maybe your first time to see Kingdom Kingdom Cast, maybe your first time um, to see this particular series we're doing. So what we're doing is we're looking at Babylon of the past, and then we'll be doing series where we look on Babylon in the present, and then we'll be looking at future Babylon as, as foretold by prophecy. Now, even though many of the last four episodes already have all of the elements kind of built in, um, as far as the main focus of each video, we're segmenting it in past, present, and future. So hopefully it'll be a blessing to you, give you a great, thorough, and contextual well-rounded view of this topic that is all throughout the scriptures. So let's keep going. Here is Greece. So guys, Greece, as we talked about before, after the Tower of Babel was destroyed and the people dispersed back to their own lands, speaking new languages now, Greece is one of the major empires that arose from those um, new languages, if you will. Mount Olympus was what they called the home of the gods. Now, even though historians will try to tell you that they that the ancient Greeks re revered or spoke of Mount Olympus as a physical mountain, and then later in history talked about it being a non-physical mountain of more of a sky dwelling. I think I'm going to put forward some things tonight to show you that they always revered it as a sky dwelling. It's only with redactionist history later on, whereas we had developed a heliocentric view instead of a biblical cosmological view have modern day secular historians try to explain, re-explain, if you will, the idea of what the ancient Greeks called Mount Olympus. So let's look at it. This is from the Iliad. This is an ancient poet from ancient Greece. His name was Homer around the seventh century BC. He spoke and the ox-eyed lady Hera was seized with fear and sat down in silence, curbing her heart. Then troubled were the gods of heaven throughout this palace of Zeus and among them Hephaestus, the famed craftsman, was first to speak, doing pleasure to his dear mother, white-armed Hera. Surely this will be sorry work. This is That is no longer bearable if you two are to wrangle thus for mortal sakes and set the gods in tumult. Neither will there be any joy in the excellent feast, since worse things prevail. And I give counsel to my mother, wise though she be herself, to do pleasure to our dear father Zeus, that the father upbraid her not again and bring confusion upon our feast." So this is just a small example of in the the mindset of someone that it was a 7th century, uh, that's what historians conclude is approximately 7th century BC for Homer. This was his mindset. This is, even though this is just a, a book that he wrote, okay, this isn't, I'm not saying that these events are actually true. It doesn't matter. In his book that he wrote, he has a consistent description of where the gods were, the gods of ancient Greece. They were the quote unquote gods of heaven. So let's, uh, we'll just keep going here. This is from six centuries later in the first century BC. Okay. So just a few years before the time of Yeshua walking the earth, 
This is from the book Aenid. It's actually it's from the collection of, of Latin poems it's called the Aenid. And it, this is actually book 10. And it's from um, Virgil is what he's generically referred to in history. But his official name is Publius Virg Virgilius Mar Maro. Yeah, that's it. Um, so he, this is what he has to say about the ancient gods in his book, his uh, epic poems in Latin. He says, Meanwhile, Olympus, seat of sovereign sway, threw wide its portals and in conclave fair the sire. By the way, by the way guys, the, the word conclave, uh, that means in secret meeting. Okay, so he says, And in conclave fair the sire, which is the word for authority of the gods and king of all mankind, Zeus, he summoned the more immortals to his starry court. He summoned them to his starry court. It's interesting. Whence high enthroned, the spreading earth he views. It's very interesting. And to Crea's camp and Latium's fierce array. Beneath the double-gated dome, the gods were sitting. Beneath the double-gated dome. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, huh? Beneath the double-gated dome. West Blaze, this is not the show you're waiting for. Sorry to disappoint you, brother this we've got several more episodes before the show you're waiting for but who knows maybe you'll find this one entertaining as well so guys this is the ancient mindset of first century bc greek or latin he's actually from rome he's the latin poet um he spoke of the ancient greek gods sitting in beneath the double gated dome in a starry court enthroned high above the earth so that spreading earth he views so he's being able to view the spreading earth below him it's a very interesting description let's keep going this is from josephus from the antiquity of the jews and sybil also makes mentions of this tower this is actually him recanting some details of the tower of babel and we actually we actually looked at this particular quote um a couple episodes ago when we we're going over the um the post nephilim the post flood nephilim and so he says in Antiquities of the Jews, chapter 4, verse 3, the Sibyl also makes mention of this tower and the confusion of the language when she says this, when all men were of one language, some of them built a high tower as if they would thereby ascend up to heaven. But the gods sent storms of wind and overthrew the tower and gave everyone his peculiar language. And for this reason, it was the city, it was that the city was called Babylon. But as to the plan of Shinar and the country of Babylonia, Hestius mentions it when he says this, such of the priests as were saved took the sacred vessels of Jupiter in Yalias and came to Shinar of Babylonia. So the reason I wanted to point that out as a reminder is that they were worshiping Jupiter at the Tower of Babel. This was Jupiter. He's the great god of the sky and thunder and the king of the gods in ancient Rome, and re uh, religion and mythology. He's the chief deity of the Roman state religion throughout the Republic and Imperial eras. In Roman mythology, he negotiates stuff. Uh, it's not, it's not, relevant to what I'm trying to get to, the second king of Rome, to establish principles of Rome religion as off, such as offerings and sacrifices. And it says the Romans regarded Jupiter as the equivalent of the Greek Zeus. So as the Romans took over and, and power throughout the kingdom, that uh, a kingdom the Greeks used to have power over, they brought in their words and their names for what the Greeks used to call these gods. So the idea of Zeus that we just read about from the Greek poets before the time of, of Yeshua, they're referred to as Jupiter, by the Romans. And this is something that we uh, we covered a little bit last time from the Flying Machines episode or part four. As you can remember, just as a quick reminder, we have the Vajra and the Hand of Zeus, which according to the ancient Indians, the Vajra was something that controlled flying machines. All right, let's move to Germania or Germania, if I could. So we're going to be talking about Asgard, but a lot of you, and before you fill up the comments saying Asgard was the Norse. Yes, I understand that. The region which they lived, as well as many other people that held the same belief set as the Norse, or quote unquote the Vikings, they lived in a realm, in a, a region of what we consider Africa today that was referred to as Germania back in the day, during the time of the Romans. The reason I'm mentioning this is because there was more than one people group that held this belief of Odin. And Odin was a Norse god of both the Norse, the Germanic people, the Dutch, and even the Celtic peoples. Between the ancient Norse, the Germans, the Gauls, and the Greeks, Odin is linked to Mercury, who is also Hermes to the Greeks. 
Mercury was a Roman name, Hermes was the Greek name, and also Mars among the Romans as well. The name Mercury is possibly related, according to historians, to the Latin word merx, which means merchandise or merchant or commerce. And mercari is a, a derivative of mercury, which means to trade. And merces is a derivative of that Greek, of that word, that Roman word, Latin word, I should say, which means wages. Another possible connection that's been researched is the Proto-Indo-European root merger for boundary and border. Uh, an Old English Mark, also an Old Norse, his name is called Mark. In the Latin, it's Margot. And by analogy of the Greek, he's considered the keeper of the boundaries, referring to his role as a bridge between the upper and lower worlds. So what am I talking about? Many people aren't aware of Norse mythology and what they talked about. We're going to get to some diagrams and pictures in just a minute. But real quick, the Roman historian Tacitus, he was also a politician in the first century, he equates Odin to the Roman god Mercury. And specifically for these reasons, in addition to being a trickster and a magician, they both had this um, uh, this trait where they would disguise themselves and be wanderers to interact with mankind. Hopefully, hopefully some of this is striking a uh, scriptural ideas to you right now. So let's look at uh, in a in a modern day setting. This is a picture on the right hand side from a, a Marvel movie depicting Thor and his father Odin. And in this movie, he has a he has the raven on his shoulder. He's the king of Asgard, and he has the trident, which is the Vajra in his hand. So an old old Norse theonym, which is just how they would say stuff. It's very, he has different Germanic cognates and how they would use their words. In the old Saxon and the old English, he was not called Odin, he's called Woden. This is actually, many people don't realize this, this is actually where we get the word Wednesday. Um, the old High German, he's called Wutan, and the old Dutch would be Wodan. All derived from the reconstructed Proto-Germanic masculine theonym, which is Wodenaz or Wudenaz. Translates to Lord of Frenzy or Leader of the Possessed also translates to delirious or raging or a master of. And so this is why Mercury and Mars are a good fit for their character attributes that were ascribed to them. He's got the Vajra guys. He's got the trident in his hand. He was the king over Asgard, home of the gods, that supposedly you could only get to from a rainbow bridge. Where are rainbows? Where do rainbows happen? <laughs> so this is the Asgardian, uh, or I should say that the Norse nine realm cosmology. They believe there were nine different positions where life lived and that the gods, whom Odin and Thor were rulers of all the gods, that they lived in Asgard, which as you can see in their cosmology was at the top of the celestial tree. And this tree was considered to fill up the whole world, basically. This was their cosmological ideal. So this is why in ancient depictions, the city where Odin and Thor lived, that you only got to from a rainbow bridge, was in the clouds at the very top of this extremely large tree. As you can see the depiction here, where it's connected to the tree at the top of it. An entire city with mountains at the top of a big tree that filled up the world. But what we see in modern day depictions of Asgard through modern movies is they've changed the cosmology. So now it's a floating city in outer space with stars around it connected by this magical rainbow bridge. That's a literal structure with various colors in it, like a bridge. It's like a crystalline structure, but it's, all, it's like a magical, um, it connects to this to something called the Bifrost, which this guy named Heimdall controls. And you actually, you can't, um, you don't follow a rainbow to get to Asgard. You actually are taken up in a rainbow colored Bifrost, which is like a teleportation concept, like, like Star Trek. Okay. So it's a very different application of this ancient cosmology and how a god of Asgard uh, for their mythology would actually get to this city of Asgard. Okay. And so this is the Bifrost machine. Take very careful note of that. We're going to be talking about this uh, type of architecture in the future. Here is in modern day depiction. This is, even though the cosmology is different, they sure did get a lot of things right once they got to the actual place of Asgard. And this is his uh, throne room, which is where Odin sits. 
course, he's got the trident in his hand, which is the Vajra. But if you look clear for, carefully, and if you remember our episode from last week, we talked about the ancient flying machines. This is the same, literally the same just, um, shape as the flying boat of Ra from ancient Egypt, who was the head head patron god of Egypt. You also have the, the two birds. Ra was considered a hawk-headed god, likened unto manifesting himself as a bird on occasion to do different things. Then you also have the two snakes. Now in, in Norse mythology, the two snakes, this was supposedly uh, connected to a brother of Thor. So Odin had, you know, various children and apparently one of his, one of his children, they had to sell a bunch of gold to get um, the, their brother, but he somehow turned into a snake. I mean, it's all very, very much mythical concepts, but the idea is that this is what's represented here. But what's, what's unique to the ancient world is that the serpent was always associated with these patron characters, these head characters over all the gods. So just like, you know, Vishnu and Shiva, the snake is always present, just like, you know, Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs you see with Ra and Osiris, the snake's present. So this is this is always something that, that was everywhere. This, there's the serpent. As well as, these, we're actually going to come back to these in future episodes. I just want to tease these ideas, take quick note of those. But as their actual cosmology, what they believed the location of these gods and where they lived was at the top of this tree that pretty much encompassed the world and all the the livable nine areas of the world. And they were at the top of this tree. So let's look at some scriptures here where we see a very similar example, okay? Now, even though this is a, a, a vision that, or it's actually a dream, I guess, that Daniel is going to be sharing with Nebuchadnezzar about a tree that reaches to the sky and fills up the world. It's, it's about how Daniel interprets and explains the symbolism of the tree is what I want everyone to take note of because it's going to apply when it comes to the idea of the rulers of the gods and how they would inhabit a place to live in and, and what the ancient world viewed. So this is from a Hebrew mindset speaking to a Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, at approximately the 5th, 6th century BC. And they're going to have the same uh, understanding of what a big tree would mean pertaining to a ruler of a vast empire or a lot of peoples. So let's look at it. Daniel chapter 4, 10 through 7. Now, these were the visions of my mind as I lay in my bed. I was looking and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong and its heights reached to the sky and it was visible to the end of the whole world. That's interesting, right? How, how could that happen on a bald earth? But I digress. Let's keep going. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beast of the field found shade under it and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. All the living creatures fed themselves from it. I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its foliage, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, with the band of iron and bronze around, around it, in the new grass of the field and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the, the decree of the angelic watchers and the decision is the command of the holy ones in order that the living may know what the most high, that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes and sets it over the lowliest of men. That is interesting, guys, right? We have a moment here where most of us already know the story. This is after this, Nebuchadnezzar, he actually goes what seems to be like mentally insane. Uh, he's, for seven years, He's turns into the behavior of a beast where he's just, you know, eating the grass of the field and he doesn't have his right mind. Um, many people believe that Daniel kind of took over the kingdom at, at this time during these, during these years where the king was incapacitated and wasn't mentally fit. And, um, but the analogy that's being drawn to Nebuchadnezzar's reign over Babylon and all the kingdoms, all the provinces, the 127 provinces that he ruled, which were other, other countries and people groups, is the analogous to this big tree that fills up the world. And everyone's participating in this big tree. So the tree analogy itself and the height of the tree being up to the sky, it's not a literal tree in this metaphor. 
it represents the power that was associated with this particular particular king. Some people may be asking, so Sean, are you saying that the ancient Greek gods and the ancient Norse gods, which I say the same, I try to show you the same thing, same people. Are you trying to say that they didn't actually have a large place in the sky that they lived? And that's not what the ancient people thought. I thought that's what you opened, you opened up to explaining, right? What are you saying? trying to give you the idea that there was accepted in the ancient world because we're going to see this earlier was the idea that the gods lived in the sky i've got more to show you a lot more but that the analogy the 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 metaphor if you will of how their power influence and their their authority if they reached a certain level would be like a great mountain that reached into the sky or like a tree that reached into the sky. Is there evidence that they actually had some place that they lived in the sky? Like the, the ancient poets talked about being the gods of heaven? Yes. But I'm trying to give you a different perspective on how people spoke about authority over lots of different regions of the earth and how it was related back to kings or rulers. Remember, I told you we're going to be looking at the rulers of these ancient kingdoms and what the average person thought of them compared to hopefully compared to, you know, a scriptural understanding as well. So I've got it. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to walk the line if I can by explaining to you two different concepts because they're all interconnected anyway. Some of the cultures spoke about, all of the cultures spoke about the gods that lived in the sky. I want to make it very clear. We're not talking, I, we've, we've explained biblical cosmology on this, uh, on this kingdom cast for six months now. They did not believe that these gods lived above the firmament. When they would talk about the gods of heaven, they believe they, they were talking about in the sky. At the same time, a great ruler could be metaphorically referred to as someone at the top of the greatest mountain or in a, a tree that fills up the whole world living at the top of a tree, right? Is a great ruler living in a big tree house? No. No, but the point is, it's their reach extends to all the world because of their authority. So there's a metaphor at play here between a person's authority and a person's actual living space. Okay, I'm just trying to draw that distinction real quick. All right, let's keep going here in Ezekiel chapter 31, 1 through 7. This is the father explaining through the prophet Ezekiel to Pharaoh of Egypt during the days of Ezekiel that Pharaoh should be very, very afraid because what happened to Assyria? Is going to happen to Pharaoh. So, but look at the, we're going to look at the descriptions because he's actually going to talk about some unique concepts about the the metaphor, the analogies of the Assyrian kingdom. And this is the same kingdom, guys, that um, came in and, and took out the northern ten tribes of Israel. Okay, in about the seventh century, about seven twenty BC. Let's look at it real quick. In the eleventh year, in the third month, on the first of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to the Pharaoh king of Egypt and to his hordes, Whom are you like in your greatness? Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon, with beautiful branches and a forest shade, and very high, and its top was among the clouds. The waters made it grow, the deep made it high. With its rivers it continually extended all around in a planting place, and sending out its channels to all the trees of the field. Therefore its height was loftier than all the trees of the field. And its bows became many, and its branches long, because of the many waters as it spread them out. All the birds of the heaven nested in its bows, and under its branches all the beasts of the field gave birth. And all great nations lived under its shade. So it was beautiful in its greatness, and in the length of its branches, for all of its roots extended to many waters. This is talking about the reach of the kingdom of Assyria to all the nations that it ruled. The cedars in God's garden could not match it. The cypresses could not compare with its bows. The plain trees could not match its branches. No tree in God's garden could compare with it in its beauty. I made it beautiful with the multiple branches of its multitude of its branches. And all the trees of Eden, which were in the garden of God, were jealous of it. And by the way, guys, Ezekiel uses the term garden of God to mean literally the area of Israel between the Euphrates and the Nile. This is the area promised to Abraham. Um, a lot of people get really confused by that terminology. We're not literally talking about um, the, the garden of Eden, this is not, he's not talking about the garden of Eden, the, the land of Eden where the garden was placed 
is where the promised land that's promised Abraham between the Euphrates and the Nile. Remember, Assyria is on the other side of the Euphrates. So geographically, he's right to compare the two. All right, let me just get back to it real quick. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it is high in stature and has set its top among the clouds, and its heart is haughty in its loftiness. Therefore, I will give it into the hand of the despot of the nations. He will thoroughly deal with it. According to its wickedness, I have driven it away. Alien tyrants of the nation have cut it down and left it. On the mountains and in all the valleys, its branches have fallen and its bows have been broken in all the ravines of the land. All the people of the earth have gone down to its shade and left it. On its ruins, all the birds of the heavens will dwell, and all the beasts of the field will be on its fallen branches, so that all the trees by the waters may not be exalted in their stature, nor set their top among the clouds, nor their well-watered mighty ones stand erect in their height. For they have all been given over to death, to the earth, beneath, among the sons of men, with those who go down to the pit. Thus, says the Lord God, on the day when it went down to Sheol, I caused lamentations. I closed the deep over it and held back its rivers. Its many waters were stopped up, and I made Lebanon mourn for it. While the trees of the field wilted on account of its... I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall when I made it go down to Sheol with those who go down to the pit and all the well-watered trees of Eden. The choicest and best of Lebanon were confront comforted in the earth beneath. They also went down with it to Sheol to those who were slain by the sword and those who were its strength lived under its shade among the nations. So guys, the reason why I just want to show you the parallel that we have in Daniel and also in Ezekiel 31, the same concept that's being spoken about two different kingdoms. Remember, before the days of Daniel, here, let me put this on screen here. Before the days of Daniel, you actually had um, the Assyrian king ruled in the northern area of Chaldea, which is Nineveh, this area that was approximately a couple hundred miles north of actual Babylon where Nebuchadnezzar ruled. But then at, Nebuchadnezzar at one point did rule over in, in Nineveh too. It was all the same kingdom. They just had different capital cities at different times in history. Um, so the point of all this is, we got the same descriptions of the power that the Assyrian king before Nebuchadnezzar shared, similar to what Nebuchadnezzar had shared when he took over that same kingdom. And when both are destroyed, all the peoples are affected. So there is some definite metaphors that are at play there. But the reason I'm mentioning that is because it's speaking specifically about the kingdom of Babylon from two different rulers' perspective. One ruler was the Assyrians that happened um, 100 years before Nebuchadnezzar, and then we have the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what we read from Ezekiel 31 about how, Eze how the Assyrian kingdom was destroyed, um, that actually was destroyed at a point in time. This is, this is lined up in Zechariah chapter 2 through 4 in the book of Zechariah. Um, oh, I said that wrong. Um, yeah, Zephaniah, excuse me. In the book of Zephaniah 2 through 4 is, uh, is furthering prophecy about the destruction of Assyria. And um, and what and also Josephus writes about it in the same manner. Um, I, I apologize, guys. I got some of my scriptures back backwards. Nahum, it's in the prophet Nahum, chapters two through four, talks about the Assyrian destruction of that kingdom. But ultimately, uh, the idea was that these massive kingdoms would be described as as uh, a tree that fills the whole world, basically. So this same description is carried over to the Germanian. Uh, cosmology, where they viewed that the gods would rule at the top of a big tree. Does that mean they did not fly in the sky, as we talked about last week from all the part four, we reviewed all the ancient flying machines? No, it doesn't. It just means when people try to come to you, the reason I'm sharing with this, I'm giving you the tools to understand there's different context in scripture referring to these same kingdoms, these same rulers of these kingdoms, and the same ideas. So people will come to you if you try to, if you get excited about this series and you're trying to relate it to other people, you may start to talk about stuff and they may have done ancient Greek or Indian uh, history, you know, uh, classes. They may take a class at some point and they may come and say, well, well, no, it just meant that there was a metaphor for their power. They didn't really live in the sky. It, it was actually spoken of in both ways in, the, in history from biblical authors to Roman poets and histori historians and even Jewish historians have spoken in the same manner that there was a there was a um, a literal place, and then there was a figurative position of power, if you will. So I'm sorry to belabor the point, but I think that it's it's just it's one that people should know, should understand. So let's go look at ancient India real quick. All right, we're going to look at some more evidence from the ancient texts about what where they believe their gods actually lived in a, in a sense. So in ancient India. 
This is the ancient god Surya that they believed in in the Hindu beliefs. The, this Surya was the god of the sun, and the sun itself represented the physical sun and personified the sun as a deity. In her early Hindu scripts, this god was considered one of the most important deities because they were sun worshippers, just like all the other cultures, <laughs> all of them. Surya is one who spends every day in the sky, like Shamash, the god of the sun, in the Mesopotamian beliefs. You guys remember in the book of Judges, um, Samson went against the Philistines who worshipped Shamash. Spelt a little different, spelled Chimash with a CH in some translations. And also, she's associated with Apollo, also called Phobos, which was the shining one by the Greeks, which was originally the god Helios. You guys, you guys, we just got Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Canaanite, all in, in one comparison with this god of Surya from historians. This is the same, same principal deity that was important to all these nations that all called by their own names the same god. But later, both gods became one, um, meaning the gods uh, Apollo and Helios. In early Greek myths, it was Helios who guarded the chariot of the sun across the sky every day, and later Apollo became identified as Helios Apollo. And from then on, his duty was to ride the chariot in the sky. So there was an actual depiction of both Surya and Apollo. That they had horses that they would take them across the sky, and they were you know, associated with the sun directly. So from the ancient Indian text, it says that in a chariot harnessed by seven red mares, or by a mare with seven heads, historians struggle to know the difference. He travels across the sky on the, or the space around Mount Maru, later called Mount Kalasha. It was the abode in the mountains where the gods dwelt, ruled by Varuna, the guardian of the cosmic order. Surya was the sun god. Agni was the god of fire, and Indra the god of war. Remember, If you remember in episode two, we reviewed the Vajras. Lord Indra was the one that had the Vajra in his hand that could control flying machines and he could shoot thunder and lightning from it. And then Yama was the God of death and Soma was the God of vitality. So this was a clear, clear distinction between Greek and Indian uh, mythology, if you will, of the lore of their gods, what they worshiped and what attributes were given to those gods. So this is a depiction from ancient Egypt or excuse me, ancient India of Mount Maru. <laughs> This is a little depiction, right? They had multiple depictions. This is just one of them. This is Mount Maru depicted in ancient India for scale and what they talked about it in their, in their manuscripts in ancient Sanskrit. So the reason I put this on the screen is because you can see that mountain of the Himalaya mountains are in this, some of the tallest mountain ranges in the world. But the arrow on the right-hand side of the, of the depiction shows where they believed Mount Maru was above the Himalayan mountains. That's how far high above they viewed where the gods lived. Just to give you guys some scale here. This is a, a tapestry work um, showing Mount Maru of ancient times from India. And you have, can you might see it yet? Here is... I'll let you look at it and take it in from it. There's a lot going on on this on this artwork. Here is Mount Maru at the top of a big tree, also in the sky. But look what's interesting. Look at all these vimanas everywhere. There's a vimana. There's more vimanas. Remember what we talked about the ancient flying machines from India last week, the vimanas? There's more vimanas. They're everywhere on here. They're all going and flying around Mount Maru. So Mount Maru, according to the ancient Indians, was the abode of the mountains where the gods dwelt. It was ruled by a guy named Varuna, who was the guardian of the cosmic order, where they believed the sun and the moon traveled in circumference around Mount Maru in the sky. And here's a little depiction between all three that we've reviewed so far. India's depiction of Mount Maru is on the left. But that big mountain in the center of those two other living areas being encircled by the stars and the planets, or excuse me, by the sun and moon and the planets. We're going to talk about Rahu and Ketu in another episode for all of you who may be wondering. This in the middle is Greece, as Mount Olympus was considered to be in the clouds above the earth where the gods lived. They had Mount Olympus, which is the home and the palace of Zeus. 
Oh, and by the way, for all of you that actually have, for all of you that actually have seen um, any of those Thor movies from from Marvel, uh, in the first Thor movie, I think it was 2011 when it came out, Odin sends a test to Thor, who's on Earth. And he sends this this uh, automaton, which is this, basically this big suit of armor that's was uh, powered by magic. So you didn't have there wasn't a person inside the suit of armor. It was just a big giant suit of armor that could move on its own like a robot. It's called the automaton, the destroyer. Um, in the ancient writings, in the ancient poems uh, from the Greek poets, they talked about in the palace of Zeus, he had automatons. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. So. This is a this is just a, a quick comparison. We got Asgard on the right hand side, also at the top of the world, in a floating piece of land where the where the people lived, who also had authority over all all of mankind. These are the same same concepts with with different artistic interpretations, yes, but the same core concepts from all three cultures. What about Babylon? What about Chaldea? Let's look at the scriptures. Isaiah 47, 1 through 5. Come down, sit on the ground, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and luxurious. Take a millstone and grind meal. Remove your veil and cover your white hairs. Make bare your legs. Pass through the rivers. Your shame shall be uncovered. Your reproaches shall be brought to light. I will exact of you due vengeance. I will no longer deliver men to you. Excuse me. I will no longer deliver the two men your delivery is the lord of hosts the holy one of israel is his name sit you down pierced with his woe go into darkness O daughter of the chaldeans you shall no more be called the strength of a kingdom let's look at jeremiah 51 25 behold i am against you the ruined mountain that destroys the whole earth and i will just stretch out mine hand upon you and will roll you down upon the rocks and will make you as a burnt mountain Jeremiah 51, 25 goes on to say, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor at the time it is stamped firm. Yet in a little while, the time of harvest will come for her. Verse 48 through 49 goes on to say, And then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon. For the destroyers will come to her from the north, declares the Lord. Indeed, Babylon is to fall for the slain of Israel. All, as also for the Babylon, the slain of all the earth have fallen. Does that sound familiar, guys? You guys remember in Revelation 18? The blood of all the prophets and all the slain of the earth are in her. Here it is in Jeremiah 51, 48 and 49. Zechariah chapter 2, 6 through 11. Ho there, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. For I have dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Ho, Zion, escape you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after glory, he has sent me against the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will wave my hand over them so that they will be plunder for their slaves. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming and I dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. My nations will join themselves to the Lord and many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst, and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. You guys recognize anything unusual about what we just read? So between Isaiah 47 and Jeremiah 50, 51, those verses, we're talking about the destruction of Babylon, which happened three, 400 years before Christ. But Zechariah 2 is prophesying the return of Christ, the second coming, the day of the Lord. This is the time when many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become his people, and he will dwell in your midst, and you'll know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. This is the time when the fulfillment of the Romans 15, which is all the way back to Isaiah 47, that those near and far off will come. All the nations will come to the Lord because he will actually be on the ground. Zechariah 2 did not happen when Babylon was destroyed by various various kingdoms during the Book of Tobit and Daniel and Esther and all those all those different rulers that happened over those two three hundred years and then eventually by Alexander the Great. So like they they were not destroyed in that manner 
that's that's described in those other passages that that happened and was fulfilled that was the destruction of daughter babylon here we have the verse six is something to take note of ho there flee from the land of the north that was the reference to babylon in ancient israel for i've dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens so if you're dispersed just like we know from deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 4 dispersed to the four corners of the earth under the heaven. Now we're being dispersed as the four winds of the heavens. So this is this is a concept. Yes, they were told to flee from Babylon, and many of them did during the days of uh, during the days of uh, um, Nehemiah and Ezra, and they were allowed to come back and get out of there. And during the, the under the authority of uh, Cyrus and Artaxerxes over a twenty year time period. So they were allowed to actually flee in, from places where they had been captive for over a hundred years. But not, the nations did not join themselves to the Lord during that fleet, during that time period where um, the people came back into Israel and they tried to rebuild the temple during the days of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. This is a day of the Lord reference for daughter Babylon. So just like we see in Revelation 18, where Babylon is mentioned again, it's the same concept. There's still Israel, that's believers, those who are in faith and belief in, in the Lord of heaven and earth, the Almighty and His Son, Yahweh and Yeshua. If you believe in them, you're grafted into Israel. But you'll be dispersed, just as is prophesied about the great resurrection. You're, you're resurrected and you're drawn back in from everywhere into the heaven, from all the different nations where we're dispersed. So this is a moment where the father is trying to use the same descriptor of daughter Babylon as the kingdom that is spread out and on the ground. But yet that same description was used of actual geographical GPS Babylon in Isaiah 47 and Jeremiah 51. How does that work? We'll review it in future episodes, guys. We'll go over some of that language in uh, future episodes. And we'll explain it with great, great depth. All right, guys. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments or put them in the live chat. Be sure to put them in all capitalization so I can see them easily. But that's uh, that's what I wanted to try to show tonight was the great parallels between as we've been fleshing out with every episode, you start to see that even though these quote unquote rulers are these little G gods that the ancient world used to talk about, they're all the same people group. It's all the same people group. They're just called different names with different artistic and you know expressions and the hieroglyphs and things like that. But and I, personally, I wouldn't even put it past them to literally just change clothes. Like the Greeks, they just literally put on the blue makeup and change clothes into into cultural attire that the Indians would recognize, and then go present themselves to me, you know, as as uh, Shiva. Like it to me, that would <laughs> it would be perfectly fitting uh, to see. Like I mean, that's literally like the the modern entertainment business of today is they reinvent themselves according to the culture that they're in, in order to portray the same mythology, the same. Um, theology, if you will, which is the occult theology, which is what all these other nations were doing anyway, worshiping Odin and Ra and Apollo and Syria, right? All these, you know, all those ancient cultures, it's all the same. By the way, guys, uh, Saria, or excuse me, Ver Varuna, I didn't really go into Varuna, the ancient Indian god, but I thought it was interesting that some of the descriptors about her was, or him, I should say, this god that, um, was also a part of Mount Maru where the gods lived in the sky and he was kind of the controller of the cosmic order around them. It's interesting because they call, talk about him being the original creator of all things and how the creative reality and existence and he was the creator of the multiverse. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. For all of you guys that um, follow you know, modern day entertainment, like the multiverse is being pushed through marvel and dc which are the big comic book movies that are coming out it's being pushed in all uh, tv shows and movies this idea of a multiverse where there's multiple gods that go through and do stuff and yeah it's it's huge right now it's just ancient vedic theology 
or Vedic, I should say, Vedic ancient Indian theology.